Today on Muscle Car, how not to do a pre-build test drive. Our Firebird gets a subframe swap and a ride in a Hearst Olds pace car. Hey guys, welcome to the shop. We're going to take a little break off our 61 Impala here and start on a brand new project, the 69 Firebird. If you're paying close attention earlier in the season, you might have seen the tease that year one gave us with the rendering. Now we promised we're going to build this thing this season, we're going to keep that promise. 1969 was the first year for the Trans Am, and that's how year one got its name. So we're partnering up with them to turn this 69 Firebird 400 into a one-off tribute car, a modern corner carving convertible version of the classic Trans Am. We're giving it an updated drivetrain and suspension, but sticking with the original styling. It'll have the best of both eras, modern drivability and classic looks. Now one thing that's different about this car versus most of the cars that we've had on Muscle Car, this one actually runs and drives. So before we tear it down, we're going to take it out, tear it up. We're not tearing up. Woo! Yeah! Woo! <laughs> This one actually runs and drives. So before we tear it down, we're gonna take it out, tear it up. Hell yeah. Start you working this thing? Oh yeah. <laughs> Crank up some white snake. You know, we spend a lot of time cooped up in the shop. It's nice to get out and drive one of these cars that we talk about all the time. Not to mention, yeah, it's a good excuse to have a little fun. And it'll be nice to see what we're going to be dealing with once we tear into this thing. You never know what you're getting into when you're working with a machine that's pushing 40. That's a long time in car years. But just like most of them we work on, this one's got its ups and downs. <laughs> what the hell is that? <laughs> Mostly, yeah, downs. It's going to require new hood, new paint, probably a new top. Hey, uh, when the training just went. <laughs> this part of the process can tell you if you're going to wind up shelling out for stuff you didn't think of. Looks like we may be writing a check for a new heater. Well, good thing it's a balmy 38 degrees. This bird came from the factory with a posi rear end. So hey, we got to see if it still works. Aww. That sucked. That really sucked, actually. All right, now this may not be the best way, but it's definitely the most fun. Now, of course, the big trick with the so-called pre-build test drive is that you can create problems you didn't even know that you had. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, no. We're overheated, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's dead. Oh. That ain't good. I think we killed it. <laughs> Pontiac used real steel, dude. Holy crap. Yeah. This sucks. <laughs> it was worth it. Pushing uphill is lame. Sometimes you gotta swallow your pride and call for help. Now she may have laid down on us before we got back, but hey, at least we got the radio to work. <laughs> I remember that thing I was saying earlier about this one uh, running and driving. Yeah, we kind of took care of that, but that's all right. We got to tear it apart anyway. The original 400's been lurking under the hood for a lot of years. Now they weren't real high revving engines, but they were notorious for creating a lot of torque. Parts are still available for these, and there's a lot of options on how to build them. Drain the radiator. But since we're looking for modern performance in our Trans Am, we're going a whole other direction. We'll show you our plans for that later on in the show. Well, someone put quarter wrench on one side and metric on this side. I don't have the right wrench for it, dude. This is a muscle car. You ain't got no metric wrenches around here. We're gonna be keeping track of all the shims. Mark them left and right. Since we're going to reuse most of the original sheet metal, we're drilling alignment holes now. It'll save us a lot of trial and fitting down the road. Next, we can pull some trim, knock some bolts loose, and drop the front bumper with a little persuasion. 
And with the coolant drained out, we can yank off the front end. Ribble loose. The easiest way to get rid of this junk exhaust is just take a saw to it. Then we can see what other surprises the bird has in store for us. Look at the floor pans. Dude, this car is a lot worse than I thought. Yeah, man, that ain't no joke. But note how they bought new floor pans. <laughs> yeah, I bought new floor pans and laid them in over the top. That's the new floor pan, that's the old one there. Oh, that's why we couldn't get no reception, dude. They used the radio for part of the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you've heard of guys using F-Body and Nova subframes and grafting them onto various early model projects. Now here's why. Just four bolts and you can roll out the subframe, complete with engine mounts, tranny mounts, power steering, everything in one neat package. We're replacing this front subframe and everything on it, so this thing is out of here. Now stick around, because we're going to keep ripping this bird apart, plus we get to check out our new drivetrain. Coming up, the bird gets its feathers pulled, and Rick shakes things up. Cocktails, anyone? Hey, welcome back. We got the gas tank out and this one legger 10 bolts history. So now we're going to start ripping out the interior and finish tearing apart the body. After punching a couple more alignment holes, we can go ahead and pull the doors off. Now sometimes the seats can be rusted right into the car, but these came out pretty easy. Well, looky here, Richard. Yeah, good times, man. Nothing plays those 80s hits like a realistic speaker. I'm going to miss this thing. Before we can get the carpet out, the console, sill plates, and seat belts all have to go. This blue carpet with its lovely brown tint sure is nice, but we're going to replace it, so I'm just ripping it out. With the visors removed, we can tackle the windshield trim. We have new trim ordered, but we're going to keep this just in case, so we got to be careful not to bend it up. The header comes off next, then we're breaking out the welding wire to slice the windshield out. Now you can buy windshield wire to do this. It's spiral wound designed to cut through the hard urethane. But this is soft urethane, so welding wire works almost as good. Now anytime you work on an old convertible like this, it's pretty much guaranteed to find rust. But I was a little surprised to find rust up here, whereas there's nothing on the dash. But that's all right, just one more little spot to fix. Meanwhile, I gotta get all the rest of the stuff off the firewall. You know, just about the time you think you got everything off, well, that's when you discover a few more bolts. Now, eventually, you're going to run out of stuff, but we still have a lot more to go. Man, these clusters are attached in about 9,000 different places, so it takes some patience to get them loose. Now, if you're recycling yours, be extra careful and keep track of what plugs in where. We're replacing the dash and wiring harness, so it's not really a problem here. Now it's time to pull the tail feathers off this bird. That means deck lid tail lights, bumper, and those cool firebird shaped trim pieces. Now here's something that you're only going to see on first generation F-body convertibles. They're called cocktail shakers and there's one that was put on each corner of the car. They're designed to dampen the vibrations caused by body flex. These mystery cylinders are filled with fluid and spring-loaded weights. They're harmonically tuned to oppose vibrating frequencies. They serve an important purpose, so they'll be going back in. Cocktails, anyone? If you're looking to buy a convertible to restore, you may want to think twice. There's a lot of extra work involved here. Well, that's why I couldn't unscrew it. There's missing screws. There's a lot of different ways to remove a top, but the main trick is to keep it together as an assembly. There's a lot of small parts that no one makes that can get lost or broken. Now this is a power top, so the hydraulic lines to the pump need to be disconnected also. Our friends at Year One gave Detroit Speed and Engineering a call and they sent us a whole shipment of stuff. We got shocks, subframe connectors, a four-link setup, engine mounts, but the coolest thing, this complete subframe. This thing comes pre-assembled with everything we're going to need. It has C6 spindles, tubular control arms, hydroform frame rails, even rack and pinion steering. This thing has everything but wheels and tires. Well, that and an engine, but we got that covered too. Check this out. Like what you see there, Rick? Hell yeah. It's an LS7. An LS7. Mm -hmm. 
GM Performance set us up with this beast. It comes with titanium rods and intake valves, CNC ported heads with offset rockers and a dry sump oil system. With a cam swap and headers, this thing is capable of 600 horse even on pump gas. Now Doug's header set us up with these ceramic coated babies that'll clear that aftermarket subframe. Once all this goes under the hood, we're going to have one bad bird. Now, technology's come a long way. And these drum brakes here, they were standard back in 69, and they worked okay for the performance that was available back then. But that LS7 is going to require a whole lot more stopping power. And that's where Bear comes to the rescue. These rotors are so massive, these suckers actually showed up in pizza boxes. And these four piston calipers over here are going to put the bite on them. Now, stick around, because coming up, we get to start mocking up our drivetrain. Up next, the car that put Olds at the front of the Indy Pack. Today's flashback, a 72 Hurst Olds pace car. In 1972, it didn't matter how fast you were making laps around Indy. Nobody was getting around this baby. Now, although Oldsmobile didn't take the checkered flag, it was defiantly leading the pack. This is a 1972 Hearst Olds, the official pace car of the Indy 500. 629 Cutlass Supremes were sent out to Hearst to be converted into Hearst Olds. They were all equipped with 455 cubic inches of Oldsmobile power backed up by a turbo hydromatic 400 three-speed automatic and a Hearst dual gate shifter. A set of 323 gears took the tire shredding power out back to a set of 14-inch wheels. Greg McKinley picked this one up in 1999, and since then he's done a complete frame-off restoration. But just because he's meticulously restored this Olds back to its original condition, well, don't think for a second he's scared to drive it. Since we've rebuilt the car, we've probably driven it uh, 10 to 12,000 miles. We take a, a view of it that it's like any other car. You know, it's been rebuilt once, it can be rebuilt again. And that's half the joy of owner and it's being able to drive it. Well said, Greg, well said. Now besides having a monster of a motor dropped in them, these cars were also given a rally suspension for better handling and a set of power disc brakes up front. The hood, with its unmistakable style, is held down by twist locks. And the scoops, well, they're not just there for good looks. They keep the hungry 455 well fed with plenty of ram air. All the Hearst Olds were painted white and given a generous helping of reflective gold stripes that run the entire length of the car, along with the hood and rear deck lid. Now, if that's not enough bling for you, the wheels, well, they were also painted gold to match. A thickly padded Landau roof, complete with a Hearst Olds marking, crowns this classic. Flag brackets out back are mounted to the rear chrome bumper that's complete with cutouts for the flanged exhaust. Up front, more chrome and four big headlamps are all set off with plenty of Oldsmobile badging. Classic Olds body lines are all wrapped with Indy Pace Car decals. About 130 of these were made as convertibles, and only 220 had the electric sunroof, complete with an integrated wind deflector. Now these cars mean business inside and out. The black interior is complemented by wood trim and the driver rides in comfort and style with a set of bucket seats. It's no wonder that Greg sees the 72 as his personal fountain of youth. Just getting into this car and starting it up makes you feel young again. It makes you remember the years when, when they used to put muscle in cars. Going down the road with the windows open and, and your hair blowing, what's left of it. It just brings back a lot of good memories. The history books will remember the Hearst Olds as the first pace car not sponsored by an automobile manufacturer. But here's something for the rest of us to remember about. Stick around because we got more muscle car for you after the break. The LS7 drops in and the cross member drops down after the break. Hey guys, welcome back. We got our subframe bolted in with no problems. However, it uses standard small block Chevy mounts, and that means we're going to have to use these adapters to get our LS series engine bolted in. 
With the adapters mounted on the block, the motor mounts can go on. They'll sit about two inches further forward than stock, moving the LS back to its correct position. TCI is sending us a beefed up 4L65E to go in the Firebird, and it's still on its way. So for mock-up, we're going to use the stock GM unit. It's the same type with the same dimensions. Time to stab it all in and see how it looks. With the adapters in place, our LS should line right up, but it's still a tight fit, so we got to be careful not to scratch up the powder coating on our subframe. Ha <laughs> ha! Success. Yes. With the engine bolted in, we can see if the headers will clear the subframe. <laughs> Doug's knows what they're doing because they dropped right in. We decided to use the original cross member, but to get all the holes to line up, we're going to have to modify it. First, I'm going to clean it up and blast it to get all the grease off. We're checking the drivetrain angle to make sure we have the four degrees we're looking for. Now, once it's positioned, we can modify the cross member to match. The center needs to come down and back, so I'm slicing that section out. Then I'll bolt them back in separately. Well, we got our end pieces and our center section here bolted in, and our drive shaft angle is looking perfect. So now what we need to do is get some eighth inch plate and fill in the gaps. I'm tacking them into place first. Then I can take the whole cross member out and weld it together. The excess needs to be trimmed off and ground down. Brent's cutting out some gusseting plates to reinforce the sections we cut out. Now once these are welded into place and ground down, we can test fit it and see how we did. Perfect. You know, this part's every bit as strong as it was originally, maybe even stronger with all the gusting and the welding that we added. But we do still have some clearance issues with this tunnel, and that means that we need to keep carving this bird up. But we're out of time for now, so until next time, we're out of here.